We have an exciting announcement. We do. We have a book club live that corresponds with your new book, The Anxiety Audit. It's really the book that I wrote to help parents and young adults and teenagers too begin to identify their anxiety patterns. And we have this course that walks you through each of the patterns. And then there's going to be a live Q&A in which we're going to go over reader questions. There's over three hours of recorded video content where Lynn and I go over each chapter highlighting a different anxiety pattern. All seven. A friend already took the course and she said that if everyone read the book and took this course every six months, that the aha moments would just be life-changing and that we weren't charging enough. (laughs) (laughs) Something that is very clear to me is that learning is a process that takes repetition. Because this material is life-changing, but it is dense. If it only took Lynn saying this stuff one time, no one in our greater family would have any anxiety issues at all. And that's just not how it happens because we're all works in progress. It's just not possible to hear this information one time and have it all figured out. So go to flusterclucks.com and check on the courses button where you can go ahead and sign up and register for the Anxiety Audit Book Club. We hope you join us. There's also a really important component to independent play, which we know that when kids and adults feel as if they are being helpful, feel as if they are doing something meaningful for somebody else, That is hugely impactful in developing one's own sense of mastery, of contribution. When you allow kids to play independently, it means that there's probably going to be some really good opportunities for kids to help each other. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. My friend texted me this this morning, so this is how I started off my day. From the latest system update from Apple, a new safety feature called Check-In, which activates while you're driving, can automatically notify family members or friends when you safely arrive at a location. Those you invite to track you can see your route, how much cell service you have, and your phone's battery level. If you intentionally deviate from your route or stop, check-in can also send your contacts an alert so that they don't worry. Okay. So Robin, I was just wondering, would it be okay if I tracked you? Because while you're traveling, I want to know how much cell phone battery you have. That's just really important information to me that I know how charged your phone is. And if you deviate, easy there, tiger. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, come on, people. Come on, come on. Okay, so Lynn, here's the thing. I think we have to stop at step one here because listeners are hearing this and saying, that's awesome. That's so great. That's so helpful. So if we got to give them a little bit about this because I just always come back to my meta level point of we raised our children in a society where we started tracking them with their video baby monitors. And now we are going to this point and the desire for certainty and information about everyone in our family at all times is in fact, not a mystery of the connection between this and our anxiety disorders. That's exactly correct. And we were planning on doing this episode on the importance of independent play. And of course, the need for autonomy, the ability to develop problem solving. And so this just happened to show up this morning. My friend just happened to show, to send me this this morning. But the thing is that the evidence, the research keeps coming out over and over and over again is that unsupervised play and activities where kids are allowed to figure things out on their own 
actually is essential to good mental health. Right. And then as they get older, that ability to drive wherever they need to and pull over and get gas or whatever. I mean, that's all about developing their problem solving skills and their sense of autonomy too. So all of this desire for certainty that seems like good parenting We just have to ask ourselves the cost that we're paying for it. I have a feeling that the majority of the people are hearing us are pushing back and not agreeing. That's my opinion. You mean that people are listening now that people are saying like, wait, 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 that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I truly believe that the majority of the listeners of us speaking right now see this as a beneficial thing. I think it's very hard for parents to let go of a possible certainty. Every parent wants that certainty. And unless you understand the cost of the certainty, you're going to still seek it. Let's talk about the cost of that certainty. Because the way I imagine this is that say your 18-year-old is driving back to college or your 20-year-old, right? Because we know that once you start tracking your kids, the research shows that parents don't stop even when the kids get older. But your 20-year-old is driving back to college or your 16-year-old is on his way to go to his summer job, and Apple notifies you that your child's cell phone only has 8% battery. And so then you get a notification, oh my God, his cell phone only has 8% battery. I better text him right now and say, hey, you better charge your phone. I'm noticing that you only have like that level of oversight, that level of direction That level of saying to your kids, I need to watch everything that you do and remind you interferes with their ability to problem solve. So an article was published. The researcher is named Peter Gray. He's out of Boston College. The research was published in the Journal of Pediatrics. And let me just quote to you one part of the article. So the authors write, our thesis is that a primary cause of the rise in mental disorders is a decline over decades in opportunities for children and teens to play, roam, and engage in other activities independent of direct oversight and control by adults. Such independent activities may promote mental well-being through both immediate effects as a direct source of satisfaction and long-term effects by building mental characteristics that provide a foundation for dealing effectively with the stresses of life. And so it just goes back to what I've been saying and saying and saying, is that the more that we take away a child and a teenager's ability to work those mental muscles, whether it's problem solving, we've talked about giving kids the opportunity to say no, right? Working that no muscle, working that I feel stress and I'm going to get through it muscle. All of that stuff allows kids to develop confidence, to develop self-esteem, to develop knowledge in themselves of what they can handle and sometimes what they can handle, which is also really helpful. When you talk about the problem solving in the teens and the driving, my daughter is 17. So this is an age group that I'm in right now. And you have young adults. But what I also think happens is that when kids could use a bit more problem solving muscle and they reach back out to the parent a lot to ask for help, ask for advice, ask for opinions, it's very easy for the parent to mistake that lack of independence as like, we're so connected, which I observe a lot. We're so connected. And we talk all the time. It's like, well, are you talking or are you actually telling them how to do things or telling them how to do things the way you want them to do it? Telling them how to do things that they don't know how to do. We have the anxiety audit, right? That phrase. But the other question is, what kind of problem solving do your kids not have? And I think that's a very important, honest question to ask of when they're seeking my help, how often and what is it for? And should they be age appropriately able to do something like that? Have we taught them the skill of solving things on their own? Yeah. And the real thing that I want to emphasize in this, because we've talked a lot about problem solving and a lot about letting them figure things out, is the connection to independent play. 
because that's what this research is saying. And that's what research has said over the past several decades is that the likelihood that your child is going to have unsupervised play in this country is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. When we look at kids being allowed to just go and and make up games, when kids are allowed to go and play in the backyard, when they're allowed to ride their bikes to the drugstore and buy bubble gum, when they're allowed to make up games by themselves instead of having a coach, instead of having a director, instead of having a parent, those are really important moments for children developing, even at the ages of five and six and seven, it really is about letting kids do things separate from adult oversight, adult organization, adult stepping in. And that's what's really becoming less and less likely over the last two decades in this country. Just kids being, you know, like kids going roaming the neighborhood, right? And parents, again, just as you were saying at the beginning, there are parents who are listening to this who are probably saying to themselves, but it's too dangerous now. Like there's too many dangerous things. Like maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, kids could roam the neighborhood, but right now it's too dangerous. And I think that is the myth making that prevents parents from giving kids this opportunity to be able to play without parents involved, without adults involved. Yeah. I mean, it's true that we're Gen X and growing up, you just got pushed out into the neighborhood and you would go play and you would roam your neighborhood. When the majority of the families don't do that anymore, I think it's also because everyone's doing so many different lessons or the parents don't let them, you know, our free time is structured very differently now than it was. It's interesting, too, because in this article, they said they referenced another study where they showed little kids, kindergartners, they showed them pictures. And if there were adults in the pictures, the kids didn't describe the scenario as play. They only described it as play if there were no adults present in the picture. Which is very interesting, isn't it? That even kids know that when we're playing, that means that parents are staying out of it. That means that grownups are staying out of it. So their sense of playfulness and their sense of being able to figure out what they want to do and how they want the game to go, they themselves almost intuitively know, like, grownups, stay out of it, stay out of it. So Robin, Mother's Day is on the way. And, you know, we want to give our moms the best Mother's Day gift we can. And I'll tell you, Skylight Frame might just be the best gift at Mother's Day. Don't forget the grandmothers too. And I think one of the things that's awesome about it is that say if we're talking about a a grandmother, you're talking about family members that are all over the country, everybody can put their pictures on this one frame. It has a gorgeous 10 or 15 inch touch screen. It sets up in less than a minute. So even the least tech savvy are able to use this. You know, your kids are at a little league game, you're taking pictures, you can put them in. It's a way for relatives to just constantly be updated and see these beautiful pictures. There's no app or subscription required to send photos anytime from anywhere. So if you really want to stay connected to your family members, if you really want to give a gift to your mom, to your grandmother, to your favorite Aunt Tootie, you get 10% off, up to $30 off your frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash flusterclux. That's right. To get 10% off up to $30 of your purchase of a skylight frame, just go to skylightframe.com slash Flusterclucks. That's S K Y L I G H T F R A M E, skylightframe.com slash Flusterclucks. Lynn. Yeah. When I was giving my son his high health vitamin yesterday morning before school, I was laughing, thinking of your husband giving you your high health vitamin with your coffee. He is very good at doling out the high health vitamins. And he was reading about it, about how much sugar is in other kids' vitamins. And he was really astounded by that information and loved the fact that these vitamins don't have sugar in them. They don't have junk in them. They don't have preservatives or additives. So it made him love Haya vitamins even more. High is made with zero sugar, zero gummy junk, and yet it tastes great and it's perfect for picky eaters as well as clearly everyone in our family of all ages. <laughs> That's right. 
It provides full body nourishment and it gives it to kids with a yummy taste they love. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gluten-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. And high is designed for kids of all ages sent straight to your door. So parents have one less thing to worry about. I just love them. And, you know, we're grownups and I love them. We worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash Fluster. This deal is not available on their regular website. So go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash Fluster and get your kids and your husband the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, we're back. I'm no different than a lot of the other families today where I don't, I can't pretend that my kids go roam outside of school. They don't. And there aren't a lot of other kids who are either, you know, and where we are. Well, that's the problem, right? So say you told your kids to go roam, they would just be like walking around by themselves <laughs> in the neighborhood, right? Right. So, I mean, that's one challenge. I would say that I think there are other ways that you can still go against the curve and fight for that space for some autonomy, especially as they get older. So, for example, ideas that we have. Some people know, like my day job, I'm in travel. My family's traveling a lot. So once they were old enough, it was like, kids, go out to dinner by yourselves. They would go, they would order, they would have their own meal. And they got to be out in the world by themselves and staying home by themselves. I think that's one area where families are still exercising that kind of problem solving. So there are ways that you can still find those opportunities to test their autonomy. And interestingly, now that I think about it, like if we were at some spring break place, that's why I've always been so much more apt of like, hey, guys, go do this by yourselves because there were other kids around. And it, it replicated more of like a 1970s neighborhood. Right. Well, even think about it. You can let your kids have unsupervised play in your house. You can say, okay, so you guys can go play and you guys can build a fort. and You guys can collect all the pillows in the house and make a big, huge fort. So it doesn't mean that they always have to be far away or you have to send them off somewhere. It's really just letting them play without the adults stepping in and directing everything. So say you don't live in an area in which your child can roam. Say you don't live in a neighborhood where there are other kids around. It really is saying, okay, but after school, if we're going to help these kids get together and have a play date, which is a fairly new term, right? Have a play date. It means that you give them space to create their own games, to create their own fun, to be imaginative, rather than having all of the activities supervised. And resolve their own conflicts, too. That's right. That's a huge part of it, too, is that independent play means that kids are practicing figuring out who gets to do what, right? So I remember when I was in elementary school, Little House in the Prairie was all the rage. And so we always played Little House on the Prairie. You had to figure out who was going to be Mary and who was going to be Ma and who was going to be Nellie. We had to figure all of that out without a teacher, without an adult standing there telling us who was going to do what and how it was going to go. You always wanted to be half pint, right? I probably did. Yeah, I probably did. I didn't want to be Nelly. Yeah, you don't have a Nelly bone in your body, which is a good thing. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I know who wanted to be Nelly, though. That's a tale for another day. <laughs> but yeah, so looking for those opportunities, I think that when we're talking about if we're connecting this back, because that's what this research was looking at, how do we connect this back to what we're seeing with teen mental health in particular? is that we're talking about something that what we refer to in this field as locus of control. And when we look at depression, when we look at patterns of depression, there is something called an external locus control and an internal locus of control. If you have an external locus of control, it means that you don't really attribute things in your life to things that you have control over or to things that you did you sort of become passive, right? So we know that passivity is that, oh, I don't have anything to do with this. This is being done to me. 
And we really want to look at helping kids. For me, it's helping them learn the difference between what do you have control over and what do you not have control over? And how can we help you experience life, right? That you have this internal locus of control. It means that you are figuring things out on yourself, that you have agency in your own life, that you're problem solving, that you feel like you can step into situations and manage them. An external locus of control means that you're just like, oh, is somebody else is in charge of me. And that's what play gives kids is that sense that they can be in charge of not everything, of course, but of, of important things in their lives. Let's link what you're saying to the context of the three paramount skills. We did a series on this where we broke up each skill, but studies have shown and how you identify problem solving, autonomy, and flexibility are those three skills. So obviously, if you have a parenting style and you were parented also in this way, possibly, where autonomy wasn't really a goal or a consideration, you are here to do what I say. You are here to fulfill a role that is not defined by you. You know, there are all these ways that we are not helping our children developing that sense of self. And when we don't do that, and then that also could come with a household that might be rigid about expectation, there's not a lot of flexibility there. And then if you're not given a lot of freedom, you've also not really developed the skill of problem solving. So all of those things holistically become a child who grows up missing a couple of three really key muscles that then play into this, what do you call it? The external locus of control. The external locus of control. No parent does this perfectly either. So we're not saying that because there are certain ways that we all have our own parenting styles uh, that we choose and that we sort of are modeling from the way we were parented that might get certain things better than others. But it's really an important thing if your child is, in fact, showing signs of anxiety or depression to really break it down to those skills. How are we doing here? What are we doing to prevent those from developing and how can we strengthen them? Right. And prevention is the key word here because we are in a very reactive period in dealing with kids' mental health in this country. So we're really concerned about what's going on with our teenagers. Parents are very afraid of all of the messages that they're getting, and it really is about prevention. The other thing in terms of what you're saying, which is all spot on, is that there's also a really important component to independent play, which we know that when kids and adults feel as if they are being helpful, feel as if they are doing something meaningful for somebody else, that is hugely impactful in developing one's own sense of mastery, of contribution. When you allow kids to play independently, it means that there's probably going to be some really good opportunities for kids to help each other, right? So somebody falls down and skins their knee or somebody's feelings get hurt, or you're trying to figure out how to include somebody who is a little shy. All these things that if you watch kids figure it out, allowing kids not only to solve the problems of who's going to play Nelly and who's going to be half pint, but also helping them solve the problems of how are we going to be kind and inclusive? How are we going to offer something to kids that allow them to be a part of this? Like all of that stuff happens during independent play. All of that social stuff happens. And so when we use play and when we use activities from a parental's perspective, as a way to just develop the skills of the activity, right? So I'm going to have them in this soccer clinic so they'll get better at soccer. I'm going to have them take this supplemental math course so they get better at math. What we miss is all of the really key social and emotional components that happen organically and that happen when we step back and let it happen. Because kids are going to get hurt. Kids are going to be excluded. And every time that a child is rejected, there's an opportunity for your child parents to step in and be the one that says, I'm not going to let this rejection happen. So not only are there the kids that are struggling with being mistreated, but it allows your kids to develop the skills 
of stopping that mistreatment by somebody else. All of those skills get muted or are not allowed to happen when we as parents are continually stepping in and making sure that things go as planned. So when I was a newer member of the family and I wasn't yet a parent, I actually watched this play out because in the family, all the cousins got together and they were all close enough in age that it was a great time when they were little to really do some independent play and negotiate personalities. They had to negotiate peace and they had to negotiate the same direction of the ways that they wanted to play. And I remember not coming from that kind of background and observing that. And there was at one point, I remember trying to kind of interfere. And I had good intentions, but I didn't know. I was like, well, maybe I could make things happy by doing this or this. And I was like, no, 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 that's okay. And I didn't get it. I get it now, of course, but I didn't then. I I wasn't even a mom. There are ways to shift this. And especially for the listeners who have younger kids, and then their families haven't yet really reached this stage, that opportunity for cousins and extended family to get together and for those little kids to really just kind of run wild is really, really healthy. And it's probably one of the few circumstances where that can happen. Because when you go back to your homes, those neighborhood streets might be kind of empty. Take those opportunities where you have them and you really, you don't even inflate their importance. They are important. They are important. Yeah. And it's not all or nothing, right? We don't say to parents like completely step out and let your kids figure out everything. One of the things that I saw with my boys as they became teenagers is that they were really good at figuring a lot of things out, but then they knew when to ask for parental help when they needed it. Like there was one situation with one of my sons where there was a real conflict between two of the boys in their group. It had to do with a girl and they were really struggling to figure it out. They were having all sorts of conversations amongst themselves and they didn't know what to do, but they asked the moms to have a meeting with them. So the moms and the boys, we ordered pizza and we talked it through. I thought that was pretty impressive, but they had tried to work on it for a good long time, like months and months and months, and they couldn't figure out what to do. So they called in reinforcements, but we didn't inject ourselves into it. I honestly knew very little about what was going on as it was going on. I got wind of it. But then they said, okay, so we need reinforcements. So the goal isn't here to say, like, let your kids figure everything out and don't be included. You want them to have that range of skills of this is something we can handle on our own. And then maybe this is something that we need help with. What I see right now, actually, is kids are very quick to go to parents for help with a lot of things in a way that perhaps in the past they wouldn't. So, for example, with homework, I talk to a lot of families where a child has homework, they take out the homework sheet, they look at it for three minutes, and then they immediately say, I can't do it, mommy, you have to help me. And that to me is the same skill of how do I struggle with this a little bit? How do I figure this out independently? Or how do I get my friends to help me with my homework instead of immediately going to a parent? Right. And again, I think it's an easy trap that if you're children ask you for help, you have to learn to hear that as something that it's about them and not about you feeling good that they asked you for help in those patterns. But we'll take a break. When we come back, I actually think we should circle back and talk about the tracking because I still feel like there are a few things to say about that. Okay. Here's the thing. Therapy works, but a lot of people get a little overwhelmed. How do you find a therapist? How do you seek out treatment? Is this going to take a long time? What are the first steps I take? Talkspace is a way to make therapy accessible and affordable for everybody. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy and accessible and affordable. And Talkspace takes most insurance. Talkspace will match you with a therapist who's right for you, typically within 48 hours, and it's incredibly convenient to be able to meet with that therapist from your own home. The goal is for you to get access to help quickly and efficiently, and Talkspace makes that possible. 
Talkspace also offers couples counseling, therapy for teens, and psychiatrists who can prescribe and manage mental health medication. And it's secure and private using the latest end-to-end bank grade encryption technology. Just remember, there's no need to put this off if there's something that you need help with. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster and get $100 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. So Robin, we've all had situations where there's something going on either with ourselves or our kids, some some symptom, some medical issue, and we really want to get help from a qualified professional, not go on social media, not ask your hypochondriac aunt what's going on. We really want to get qualified, valuable information from people who actually know what they're talking about. That just happened to you. When we are hurt or when we're sick, the one thing we need is quality information from a specialist. And quality information that's available to you as well. So ZocDoc is a way for you to go and find a doctor that's right for you. And it's seamless. The quality care you need is just a few taps away in the ZocDoc app. Yeah, ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed and they take your insurance and are available when you need them. And they treat almost every condition under the sun. You don't have to waste a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong with you on your own. Millions of people have used ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood. The doctors are patient reviewed and they fit your needs and your schedule. Go to ZocDoc.com slash Fluster and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. And many are available within 24 hours. So that's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Fluster. Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Fluster. So Lynn, the summer's here and I'm going to be traveling a lot this summer with my family. And I have my Earth Breeze laundry sheets in my suitcase <laughs> because this is not the laundry detergent that comes in a big plastic bottle of goo. These are just little sheets that look like dryer sheets. Well, that is exciting, actually. Why don't you leave your family at home and just bring your Earth Breeze sheets? Then I won't have any dirty clothes. (laughs) Yeah, right. And speaking of dirty families, I've got three guys in my family. And it's important that whatever laundry detergent I use gives my clothes a fresh, clean result. And that's what we get from Earth Breeze. I love it. I don't know that I'll take it in my suitcase, but I certainly love the fact that we don't have all these big jugs going into landfills. And I don't know why somebody didn't think of it a long time ago. It's a completely environmentally friendly packaging and you subscribe to Earth Breeze and they will mail you your laundry sheets. You can pause your subscription anytime. And I love the fact that they also work for sensitive skin and at every wash temperature. Tough on stains, fights odors, your clothes come out clean every time. Switch from that old fashioned goo to something new. Right now, listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. So go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, so now back to the show. So, Lynn, you know, we did a whole episode on tracking, and that was in reference to more common apps like Life360 and fighting that desire, fighting that addiction for that control of knowledge of your kids at all times. If you listen to that episode, it really talks about all the skills that kids don't learn and don't practice that the app kind of does for them. I got a couple of interesting pieces of feedback from that episode. And I just want to say, because it's not always all or nothing, I have a friend who said, we use the app, but not in the way that you describe. We have it so that there are certain moments where I've wanted to give my kids a new level of freedom. And I encourage them to go and do something that might have been like a little more adventurous. And that app was there if they needed help finding their way home, or it was more of a crutch if there was a problem. 
as opposed to a mom sitting there staring at the app in a habit when the kids are not at home. I'm not against parents and children being in communication, particularly like say your child is 18 and they're going to go into Boston for their first concert, right? And you're like, okay, so I want to make sure that you're okay. The thing about the tracking apps is that it's not that the child is communicating with you when they need help. It's that you are watching them and seeing how they are. I mean, I just heard this funny skit about this. I can't even remember where I heard it, but the person was watching and saying like, oh my God, where's my kid? Where's my kid? And they had stopped to get a donut or something. And so I am not opposed to you using a cell phone as a way to say your child is going into Boston for a concert and you say, when you get there, I want you to text me that you got there. But what the tracking app does is that you are watching every micro movement and the parent is waiting and wondering and assessing minute by minute. That's what I see with the tracking. The danger of the tracking apps is that there is an assumption that you always have it to avoid taking responsibility of communicating with people. And that's a very bad thing. You're not insisting on your kid learning that skill where you say you didn't let me know that you were there and you're showing me that you don't know how to stay in touch. Right. Yeah. And I agree with you. There's really nothing about this Apple check-in that sounds... Good, to be honest. Do you want a notification every time that your daughter's phone battery is low? I mean, that to me is just absurdity. So I hear what you're saying, but I also, I think that fostering communication and cell phones in and of themselves offer a level of communication that can be very helpful for sure. I mean, I think I've benefited from it. You've benefited from it. My husband doesn't have a cell phone. There are many times where that has drive me crazy that I can't find out why he's late. But I think tracking apps, I would say that the huge percentage of tracking apps are a presumption of danger, a presumption that you need to make sure your child is safe all the time. And there is a real tendency to jump to a catastrophic conclusion when there is no catastrophic conclusion. I think that happens. I'm going to hold firm on that is that the likelihood that the tracking app is just a way for you in certain situations to provide helpful information. I don't think that's how they're used because they got a cell phone. In reality, I just don't think that that happens very often. Well, and you had a child who had an accident in the snow on a road, not in your state. And having an app would not have changed the outcome of how it was resolved. Correct. He was fine, but the car was totaled. Not to be catastrophic, the only scenario where that app and that technology would have offered something was if he had fallen unconscious in the car instead. But here's what that requires of me. Catastrophic thinking. (laughs) Well, not only that, but constant observation. So he was 20 years old and he was driving to his friend's house. He was driving from his college to his friend's college and he got in an accident on this snowy road right? So in order for that to be helpful, if he had fallen unconscious, if he had gotten hurt and falling unconscious, that presumes that I am actually paying attention to the fact that my 20-year-old son is driving to visit his friend in college. Right. I don't want to do that. And of course, you wouldn't do that. Yes. So I don't want to be like, oh, okay, so I'm just going to have this available to me just in case my son gets in an accident and is unconscious, which also means that I'm going to know that he was driving from point A to point B, which I really don't need to know, right? I mean, that's the whole thing is that it allows me to have information about the micro movements of my children, my adult children, Mm -hmm. just in case something happens. I just don't think it's helpful. You just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I don't want to be on my phone being like, why is he driving? From that place to that, I wonder who he's going to visit. And then I can text him, hey, why are you driving on that road? Maybe you shouldn't be driving on that road, which you shouldn't have been. But I wouldn't have known that looking at the tracking app. It just requires a level of involvement by me so that just in case that thing happens, I have gazillion other pieces of information that are there that are not necessary just in case that bad thing happens. I don't think it's helpful or necessary. Well, and people who are listening still might resist and have a hard time with saying, 
Why is that a bad thing? So if you're one of those people, (laughs) there is a cost to it. There is a cost to constantly needing that information. Listen, I spend my life hearing from parents that say, why is that a bad thing? Right? I'm only trying to help my child. Why is it a bad thing that I am helping them with their homework? Why is it a bad thing that I know every grade that my child gets in school because that way I can make sure they're doing what they need to do? Why is it a bad thing that I have a baby monitor in my 12-year-old's bedroom because if something bad happens, what's the downside of having a baby monitor in my 12-year-old's bedroom because if by chance she were to be abducted, that is totally worth it. I spend my life hearing people say to me, What's the downside of being over involved? What's the downside of knowing all of this information? And I can tell you what the downside is because the downside is we've got a generation of kids right now that are really struggling with their sense of autonomy, their ability to manage their feelings, their ability to navigate through relationships. The downside is you have to give them room to figure out the normal things. And if you are completely focused on taking away their independence because you are focused on worst case scenarios, I will tell you there are a lot more kids right now that are in trouble because of emotional difficulties compared to being in trouble because there's a kidnapper. And I think that that's where the problem arises. There's a real loss of perspective in terms of what our kids need. And if you go catastrophic, you're going to take away the daily things they need in order to prevent the catastrophic things from happening. That's the problem. That was perfect. And if that was hard for you to hear as a parent and you're just not quite sure, rewind, listen to that again. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say is that you might have to hear that a few times because I said a lot in that. And this is never about blaming. It's never about wagging my finger at people. This is a societal thing that we need to address. And it's hard. This is not intuitive. And particularly if you are anxious, if you are a worried parent, this is going against everything that you want to do. So much of this is ultimately about the parents' anxiety. So I would just like to remind people that we have a book club this summer. Yes, we do. So you can listen to the book. You can listen to the anxiety audit or you can buy it and read it. Yeah. You can buy it and read it or you can listen to it. You have to buy it and listen to it too. Or you could check it out of a local library or you could borrow it from a friend. You can buy a copy and give it to your worried friend. You could do that too. So the anxiety audit course is a supplemental discussion after each chapter because I think this stuff is dense. You need to hear it a lot. No one hears this one time and says, okay, I'm good. This is stuff that we have to apply and learn to identify in our own patterns again and again and again before we see change. I have to say that it's really been incredibly helpful for me since we started talking about these seven patterns. Actually, I think it was January of 2021 when we started doing it this way and breaking it down. So I think that it's really life-changing, and I speak from personal experience, to really understand these patterns and all the ways they disguise themselves so that we can recognize, oop, there's my anxiety. Yep. Oop, there it is. (laughs) (laughs) If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community, and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. If you like this show, there's a decent chance you'll also enjoy The Shameless Mom Academy. Hi, I'm Sarah Dean, the founder and host of The Shameless Mom Academy. The Shameless Mom Academy is a podcast for moms that centers moms more than it centers your kids. I'm not going to teach you how to make baby food or how to make your three-year-old or 13-year-old stop having tantrums. Instead, I'm going to bring you back to yourself. For the last 20 years, I've been helping moms through growth and transformation. Inside the Shameless Mom Academy, I help you identify who you are and who you are becoming. Look, motherhood is hard. It brought me to my knees many times and sometimes still does. Returning to who I am and who I am becoming allows me to decide how to show up in all those sticky motherhood moments, but also in all my other relationships and in all the ways I show up in my various communities. So come check out the Shameless Mom Academy wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm willing to bet you'll leave feeling a little inspired and maybe even completely fired up. 
And you'll probably laugh a few times because I promise we never take ourselves too seriously over here. With 700 episodes to choose from, you're likely going to find something that sparks and speaks to you inside the Shameless Mom Academy.